Hello, and welcome to the Capitola Planning Commission meeting. This meeting is open to the public, both in person attendance at the City of Capitola Council Chambers at 420 Capitola Avenue, and remote use viewing is also possible. The Planning Commission and staff are attending in person, and members of the public wanting to offer public comment need to be present. The public can live stream the meeting on the city's website, on YouTube, or on Zoom, following the link on the meeting agenda. Can everybody hear me? This thing feels like it's going in and out. Yeah, sorry. I'm having a hard time hearing. Who, who was that? Ben. That was Ben Noble. He is Zoom. Oh, thank you. It, yeah, I can, it's in a can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to try speaking directly into it and just thank you for the input. Um, the public can live stream the meeting on the city's website, on YouTube, or on Zoom following the link on the meeting agenda. As always, this meeting is cablecast live on Spectrum Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and AT&T UVerse Channel 99. See? Did it again. Yeah. You know, we're going to take a, a one-minute break. We're going to swap out the mic. Or, yeah, let's check the floor. Testing, one, two, three. Yep. Testing, testing, testing. Yes. Hello. Testing. Let's just continue. <laughs> All right. Um, it's being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Mondays and Fridays at 1 p.m. on Spectrum Channel 71 and Spectrum Channel 25. A recording of the meeting will also be available on the city's website after the meeting. Our technician tonight is Quinn. And as a reminder, please turn off your cell phones during the meeting. Okay. Um, item one is roll call and Pledge of Allegiance. Do the roll call. Commissioner Esty. Present. Commissioner Westman. Here. Commissioner Wilk. Here. Vice Chair Jensen. Here. And Chair Christensen. Here. Um, moving on to item two is additions and deletions to the agenda. Um, we we received an additional comment on item 6A. This comment came in via email with an attached letter from Malone Geyer a uh, little after 5 p.m. this evening. Uh, it's regarding the timing of the mall updates. Um, and you each have a copy at your seats, and uh, that's all we've received. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item three, um, oral communications. Members of the public may speak for up to three minutes unless otherwise specified by the chair. Individuals may not speak for more than once during oral communications. All speakers must address the entire legislative body and will not be permitted to engage in dialogue. Hi. My name is Goran Klapichan, a Schweizer Army veteran. That means Swiss Army veteran. I served overseas in the Army for an extensive period of time. I som somehow overheard uh, a police uh, deputy or something uh, telling me in the morning here that uh, uh, they're trying to legalize marijuana in the state of California. I think uh, this is a huge problem. Uh, I don't think we should uh, teach uh, young kids or teenagers to smoke marijuana or act like Snoop, uh, Snoop Dogg. Um, that's my personal opinion. I don't know uh, what it differs with uh, marijuana dispensaries or whatever the heck that is. But uh, when I served in the army, uh, people were disciplined. Uh, they were uh, punished for smoking marijuana and using other illicit drugs in the army. Thank you very much for listening. God bless you all. Take care. Thank you. Anybody else have any, any hearing none? Okay, 
Moving on to item four, planning commission and staff comments. Do we have any commission comments, staff comments? Hi, um, I have um, some updates for you tonight. Um, tonight will be Austin Wesley's last meeting. He's moving on to a new adventure. And um, so we've really enjoyed having Austin on the team and it's been great and his will forever have your meeting minutes, Austin, but really appreciate your you being a team player and uh, your efforts here. Um, many of you, I'd also like to introduce Rosie Wyatt, and many of you have talked to Rosie whenever you call City Hall, you get a nice friendly voice on the other end and who is very well informed of, of all things happening in the city of Capitola and often can answer most of the questions that come into the desk or forwards folks on to the correct person. So Rosie's been working for the city for over a year as the customer service office coordinator. She enjoys assisting the public and collaborating with her coworkers, and she takes uh, pride in striving for excellence with her customer service skills. Rosie is excited about, she'll be stepping into the role of acting deputy clerk. And um, one thing to know about Rosie is that in her free time, she loves to garden and spend time in her yards with her dogs, cats, and chickens. And we all appreciate her chickens for the eggs we get at City Hall. <laughs> So um, congratulations to Rosie, and again, thank you, Austin. And those are my updates, so thank you. Any comments? Yes? Uh, yeah, I'd like to congratulate staff uh, for all the hard work in getting the housing element through the state. It's a, it's a heck of a challenge. Um, I have to say I was worried at the beginning of this, having watched in all the cities in Silicon Valley really struggle with this. Um, I wish you to pass my congratulations on to Veronica. I think she did a good job of guiding us through this whole messy process. And uh, congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Yeah, I just like to echo those comments. I, I think, and also thank the, our other commissioners for all their hard work. Um, and then just one thing of a public notice um, this weekend, we're having. Um, a work party on the wharf, um, and it's um, helping put together the benches and tables and trash cans that were purchased by the community. And um, I know the city is going to have a link on their website uh, this afternoon or tomorrow if anybody wants to sign up. It's Saturday morning at the head of the wharf, starting at 730, and it's going to be a, a community event that we'll be working together. So uh, I'd like to invite everybody to come out. So thank you. Thank you. Anything else? I have something, yes. Yes. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, Rosie on, on her new position and thank uh, Wesley for all his support and hard work. Um, but the issue I'd like to address is, uh, I'd like to address you directly uh, on an issue that's been a pet peeve of mine for a long time, which is our tree policy. So the reason I bring this up now is because I had uh, opportunity, a friend of mine, uh, recently purchased some property in, in Capitol and he, he knew I was on the planning commission and said is, you know, can you help me through the, you know, the procedures and policies and whatnot to try to, to try to get approval. So, so I tried to do that and Brian was very helpful and, uh, but it came to uh, a tree, a big giant healthy tree on his property. And he said, well, what do, how do I, I don't like, I want to, you know, this tree's kind of in the way. What do I do? I said, well, you got to get a tree permit. So we did, and it turns out the first thing you have to do on a tree permit is to get an arborist's report. Now, this will likely be tied to a future application. So rather than being too specific on an application, I am not going to be specific on this application. I'm going to quickly diverge into a general topic. I, I just want to be clear that we cannot have a we can't have a pre-meeting about an item that will be coming to the Planning Commission. So if we can be more, if you can speak in general terms about our code exactly. rather than a specific property and story. I, want, I only brought that up as an introduction as to why I'm bringing this up now as opposed to the many other opportunities we've had. Although we haven't had many opportunities because we're always busy with the housing element and whatnot. Um, so the issue is, and I'll, I'll cut to the chase here, what I'm hoping you will do before the end of the year, actually, and who knows what happens next year in terms of the makeup of this planning commission, but while we're still together, I would like to address the notion of being having some sort of policy, 
some sort of policy to remove a healthy tree on your property if you're a resident, if, you, if you're a homeowner. Currently, again, you need, a, you need to start out with an arborist report because the assumption is that the only reason you're moving, removing a tree is because it's unhealthy or it's a safety issue or, you know, it's interfering with your sewer lines or something like that. Uh, other municipalities, municipalities have mitigation fees like, you know, okay, we love trees in our community, but so if you want to remove your perfectly healthy tree, you're going to have to submit so many, you know, so, so much, do so many dollars to our tree fund. We, we actually have a tree fund in Capitola. So, um, you know, so why not have, you know, that as an option or oftentimes when we have applicants in front of us and they have a remodel uh we always just insist on 15 percent canopy coverage that seems to be our go-to so we so uh, you know why couldn't we just say all right as long as you have 15 percent or 30 percent or some number why you know you can move this tree or or two to one or mitigate some some policy that says you can remove a tree now i, I would like you, us to discuss this and one of the things that bothers me about this is that the city has no problem removing healthy trees. You know, I, we've talked several times about the um, can, uh, canary pines at the end of the wharf, which the city removed. They were perfectly healthy trees. They didn't interfere with the sewer lines. The only complaint was that they dropped needles on the sidewalk. But the, the city removed them, and their rationale was, well, we have a, mitigate, or a tree mitigation plan. So the city then will, you know, maintain the canopy. They'll put trees elsewhere. And so if the city can do that, and they've removed a tree right out front here, they paved it over, a nice big tree that is now concrete. Um, so if the city can have a mitigation plan, why can't a resident have a mitigation plan? So again, uh, I, would, I would hope that we could get this on the agenda, perhaps this year. Um, while while we're we can we're all still here to discuss it, and um, and and yeah, that's 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 kind of what I'm hoping for, and um, I don't know, can I get an amen, Susan? An amen? No. All right. <laughs> Thank you. That's my comments. You're welcome. Okay. Um, any more comments from the commission? No. Hearing none. Staff. No. Okay. Moving on. We're moving. Um, moving on to the consent calendar. Item five. All matters listed under the consent calendar are considered by the Planning Commission to be routine and will be, be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. There will be no separate discussion on these items prior to the time of the Planning Commission votes on the action unless there's the Planning Commission request specific items to be discussed for separate review. Items pulled for separate discussion will be considered in the order listed on the agenda. Is there any... A I'll second. Okay, a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call? Commissioner Esty? Aye. Commissioner Westman? Commissioner Will? Aye. Vice Chair Jensen? Aye. And Chair Christensen? Aye. Okay, um, moving on to the public hearing. Public hearings are intended to provide an opportunity for public discussion of each item listed as a public hearing. The, fo the following procedure is as follows. One, staff presentation. Two, planning commission questions. Three, public comment. Four, planning commission deliberation. And five, decision. Item A is a citywide zoning code update. We have a staff presentation. Thank you and uh, good evening, commissioners. Chair Christensen. Uh, this is the next round of the zoning code amendments and zoning update. I want to note that we have Ben Noble joining us through Zoom today. He'll be starting us off with the presentation. So with that, uh, welcome, Ben. Great. Thank you, Sean. And I oh, believe that yes, you are driving the uh, PowerPoint presentation. That's correct.
Yes, Austin. <laughs> You've done a great job. <laughs> Can you see this? I can. Yep. Looks good. Thank you. Um, so good evening. My name is Ben Noble, and I'm the consultant who is assisting with the zoning code amendments. Next slide, please. So the purpose of the meeting tonight is to give the planning commission, commission an opportunity to review the proposed zoning code amendments uh, prior to the September 29th meeting. Uh, at which the Planning Commission will be asked to make a recommendation to the City Council um, uh, to take action on these proposed amendments. So uh, include, uh, uh, previous slide, please. And so included ben. in the um, staff report is a link to the proposed zoning code amendments. And um, uh, that draft uh, includes um, some yellow highlighting that identifies new amendments that the Planning Commission uh, did not previously review. So we wanted to highlight those for the Planning Commission's attention. Uh, and as discussed in the staff report, uh, there are three topics that we think warrant um, uh, some discussion from the Planning Commission, and they have to do with uh, density bonuses, uh, office uses in the commercial zones, and second story decks and balconies. Uh, and so what we propose for the meeting tonight is uh, to begin by focusing on these three topics um, with a brief, uh, brief presentation, and then an opportunity for public comment and planning commission questions, and then any kind of discussion or feedback that you would like to give us um, on these topics. Uh, and then so after we complete our discussion of density bonus, we would then move into the next topic, which is office uses in commercial zones. So those are the three main topics for tonight. Um, we'd also like to receive any additional planning commission comments on the draft amendments, understanding that uh, this is the last work session before um, a hearing uh, to consider recommending the amendments. Um, there were, we received a few uh, planning commission questions about the materials and we have some slides to go over those um, questions uh, after we cover these three topics and then just to uh, provide an opportunity for any other planning commission questions or comments um, before we return for the public hearing so that is the game plan for tonight i think similar to prior work sessions and if that sounds good uh, we'll move on to the first topic which is density bonus. We move on. The September 29th date is not correct, is it? The September 29th is a Sunday. <laughs> yes, I believe you're correct. That should say September 19th. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I also want to mention um, that we do have several folks in the audience, and I don't know if the Planning Commission would like public comment up early to this evening so they can be heard um, before we get into these three items, um, but up to the chair. Everybody, you okay with that? Okay, uh, what, what's it? Um, I, we, yeah, <laughs> I, I think it would be a good time to open. All right, which items are you? <laughs> this, this evening on our agenda, we have the zoning code update. The three items we'll be focused on is the density bonus, office uses in the commercial zones, and second story decks. And we'd like to, we could bump one of these topics earlier for the public if you'd like. So the, the, um, the order we have them in right now is density bonus, then office uses, then second story decks. So... If, if there are any zoning code items that you want to make public comment that are not on this slide, we could also open a public hearing for you for that. No? Okay. Okay. We're okay to proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so density bonus. Um, this amendment is included because of the housing element program 2.5, which calls for the city to update the density bonus ordinance to comply with state law and to help facilitate facilitate the production of affordable housing. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, state density bonus law um, is uh, something contained in the government code, um, a tremendous amount of detail in that law. And as an overview, um, what it does is it requires local agencies, cities and counties to grant increased density and other incentives for qualifying affordable and senior housing projects. Next slide, please. The city has processed the number of density bonus applications over the years. Um, uh, a year or so ago, the city approved a project at 4401 Capitola Road, which was an affordable, 100% affordable project that utilized the density state density bonus law. And that project um, requested a number of concessions and waivers, um, which is uh, means sort of deviations from city development standards. And they requested deviations from uh, daylight plane, side setback, parking, height, tree size, entry orientation, and massing breaks. And so under state density bonus law, if those uh, concessions and waivers are necessary in order to allow for a feasible, affordable project, the city um, must grant these uh, deviations from standards. So state density bonus law is not just about uh, allowing for increase in um, density or the number of units allowed. It's also about um, allowing for deviations to standards in order to um, allow for feasible, uh, affordable de development projects. Next slide, please. So the city has an existing uh, density bonus ordinance. It's actually not in the zoning code. It's in a separate um, title within the uh, municipal code. It's chapter 1803, uh, and it was last updated in 2009. And since that time, there have been a lot of changes in state density bonus law. And um, there's a fair amount of discrepancy between what is in Chapter 1803 and State Density Bonus Law. And for that reason, staff typically uses uh, the government code, state law, um, not uh, the Chapter 1803, 1803 when processing density bonus applications, just because existing um, local density bonus ordinance is so out of date. Next slide, please. And so given that, um, we um, have prepared an entirely new chapter 1803, uh, which focuses on procedures for uh, the review of a density bonus ordinance and um, the approval process, um, as well as adding some other details uh, that apply to a density bonus application that are not explicitly specified in state law. So we've removed um, specific affordability and density standards, um, which often change uh, when the state uh, legislature updates uh, density bonus law. And we've replaced that with general references to state law, which will help um, keep uh, the uh, chapter 1803 uh, up to date and current with state law. Next slide, please. And so that's it. That's um, an overview of uh, the density bonus um, ordinance. And um, uh, we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, if you'd like me to go into any more detail about what that ordinance contains, uh, we're also happy to do that. Can you ask a question? Um, I have one minor question. Uh, in the heading, you mentioned that this density bonus applies to affordable projects and senior projects. And if you read in our housing element, uh, we also talk about projects for people with disabilities. And we say in there that uh, the accommodations which they need are very similar to the accommodations that you need in a senior project such as, you know, how the kitchen's designed, having the unit accessible. And so I'm wondering if when we talk about senior housing, we want to sort of 
ha have an asterisk and also, you know, say senior or, you know, um, people with disabilities or whatever the proper term is now uh, included in that category because it's, it's very difficult to get a housing project built that is just for people who have disabilities. And um, uh, they do normally mesh very well into senior type projects. And I think this could, you know, help us in the future uh, to make certain that we're meeting the needs of that demographic as well as, you know, affordable and seniors. So that's. So, um is there is there a question attached well, to that? My question is like in the in the title where you talk about senior. Can we add senior and disabled housing or something like that? So we make certain that they're included. I mean, I so, don't know if state law just says senior housing or. Yes, my my initial response to that is that um, the city of Capitola could choose to do that if it wants to, um, which would essentially be, go be going um, beyond what state density bonus law um, requires the city to do. And many cities do go above and beyond state density bonus law requirements. And if that's the wish of the planning commission, um, we could do that. I think we would need to add some detail as to what would qualify for a density bonus um, that is neither a senior senior or an affordable project for persons with disabilities, um, but we could do that. And I don't I don't know how everybody else feels about that, but I think that's a need that we haven't addressed and the things that we've been working on, and we do talk about it in our housing element. Yeah, their their needs are similar. Yeah, I can agree that I, I think the definition might have to be a little more defined on what would you know isolate down to what what those characters are um, I guess subcategories would look like underneath that, but I, I think it's a, a wonderful idea. Yes, we um we could definitely bring back an edit that you could look at more closely at then at the next hearing for that. Um and I believe that it does it takes it a, a step beyond the state density bonus law and we do we've got um, the Dakota apartments which is a great 100% um, community for affordability and dis disabled um, but yeah there's definitely a great need as identified in our housing element um, chair Christensen if you'd like we could open the public hearing on the density bonus portion okay um, we could take this time to open the public hearing if anybody would like to speak on this topic. Hearing none. Okay, closing the public hearing for this topic. Um, moving. Would you? Do we have more questions? For question. a question. Okay. Should we move on and then bring the deliberation back? Once well, you know, it'd be, if there's any more uh, items related to the density bonus, I think this would be the appropriate time to talk about. No, I like the approach of, you know, just tying it to the state law. So as the state law constantly changes, we don't have to constantly change our zoning ordinance. So it works for me. Yeah, the, the only downside is you've got to wade your way through the state law, but people that are doing this probably already know it anyway. That's my guess. So yeah, I think that's I think it's a really good idea. Yeah, I I also am a good with the idea of uh, just again tying it to the state law and, and just trying to make our uh, code consistent with the state law. The concern about adding the handicap uh, portion of it is just the devil in the details. So if the staff can come up with some wording that makes sense that um, that isn't going to create a, some sort of conflict with the state law or um, get us into trouble. Um, I'm all for that. So if they want to take up that challenge, I'm, all, I'm okay with that. Would that be something that you guys, would, um, this city staff would issue early for comments back and forth before just our packet? No, you know, um, this is something we would work on uh, with Ben and also with Layla to make sure that whatever we draft complies with state law and um, 
is worded in such a way that it's fair. Um, so yeah, I think it's a great addition to this and we will try to turn it around for the recommendation. If it's something that our legal team needs more time with, we could also bring it back in the 2025 updates. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, are we safe to move on to the next topic? Yes, yes, okay. Thank you, Ben, go for it. Great, thank you. Okay, next topic is office space in commercial districts. And um, the Planning Commission previously discussed this topic, both at a high level and um, with some draft amendments um, to consider. There was a request um, to talk about it um, with a little more attention. So um, that's what we're doing here tonight. And I think as you recall that um, within the two commercial zoning districts, so the CC and the CR, which apply um, to, Capito to 41st Avenue and parts of Capitola Road, um, uh, within the CR zoning district, uh, new office uses um, are not allowed on the ground floor. Um, and this has recently created some issues where there was vacant office space that seemed vacant um, tenant space that seemed uh, appropriate for office, but couldn't be filled due to this um, prohibition. And so um, based on prior uh, planning commission discussion, uh, we prepared some revisions to the zoning code to um, provide a little more flexibility on where um, ground floor office can be allowed in the CR zoning district. Next slide, please. And so um, the um, most recent draft of the amendments that deal with this topic um, are shown on the screen here with this table. So in the CR zoning district, um, what we say is that uh, there are certain circumstances where ground floor office uses are permitted with a conditional use permit. Um, so it has to be in a multi-tenant building and then one or more of, of um, two possible conditions need to be met. Either the entry doors um, need to, to face um, to the in interior of the parcel, not the adjacent street frontage, or the building um, uh, can't front um, 41st Avenue or Clare Street. So if those, if one or if one or both of those conditions are met, uh, then the planning commission could allow for office uses with a conditional use permit. Next slide, please. Uh, and that's for new, um, uh, that's for offices in tenant spaces that are not existing office use. Um, we've also amended the language um, to be a little bit more permissive about existing office spaces. So um, if there's an existing office space, uh, a new office tenant can occupy that existing office space as a permitted use without the need to obtain um, uh, a conditional use permit or other permit that would otherwise be required for a new office space. So that um, is included as well in the amendments. Next slide, please. And so here are some examples of how um, these rules might apply to some specific properties um, in the commercial zoning districts. So, um, uh, so Pizza My Heart, for example, that building at 2045 40th Avenue, um, that could not convert to an office use. Um, first of all, it's a single tenant building. Um, and also um, it has entry doors that are facing an adjacent street frontage and the building fronts 41st Avenue. So this would not be eligible to convert uh, into an office use. Next slide, please. Uh, and so the David Ling Realtors building uh, on 41st Avenue, that's currently a office use. So there could be a change in office tenant that would be allowed by right um, without the need to obtain a conditional use permit. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's some um, multi-tenant buildings. Uh, these are properties that we've looked at previously. And uh, the way that the language is drafted now at 2045 40th Avenue, um, all non-office space in this building could convert to an office 
with a conditional use permit because the building does not front 41st Avenue or Clare Street. So any of this tenant space um, that's currently non-office, if they wanted to convert it to office, they could do that with filing an application for a conditional use permit that would go before the Planning Commission. Next slide, please. And on this building, 2011 40th Avenue, uh, the non-office space um, in this building um, may convert to office with a conditional use permit, but only if the entry doors um, do not face the adjacent street. So it would only be for the tenant space that have um, the entry to the uh, interior parking lot, not street fronting um, entries. Next slide, please. So um, that's uh, a summary of the uh, uh, office space and commercial zone provisions as they're currently drafted and um, as requested by the Planning Commission. Um, we brought it back to you. And if you have any questions for us or things that you'd like to discuss, uh, we're happy to do so. Thank you, Ben. Um, like to ask any questions? Commissioner? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, so on that, that side right there, it looks like the... <laughs> unit on the far left doesn't look like it has doors facing out to the street and maybe the next unit does is that and if that's the example um if that unit in the middle did have doors would they be able to come in for uh, through the process and remove the doors that they had one going out to the other side and then it would fall into that it could become an office building or would that be a change in the building use you know i was trying to understand the process so in sean do you want to answer I mean, if you're asking, could they reorient the building? I think, is that the question? I mean, if the door, you know, part of the process, you know, their neighbor building when that was occupied there didn't have doors, could they come in part of the process and say, we want to make this an office building? And to do that, we're just going to remove the door out to the front to comply with, with the uh, new regulations, and then we have a door out the back. Would that be a part of it? Or are there no alterations made to the building first to make it comply? So I think the, the higher level answer would be that this this provision doesn't add other restrictions to uh, development um, or the ability to modify structures. So whatever would be generally allowed, uh, perhaps with the requirement of needing a design review, um, it would still be possible. Uh, and if that if those changes would modify in a way that could make it eligible, then I, I think that is a possible outcome. The, the exact order in which they would need to go through that, I hadn't really analyzed too much, but I, I think the answer is yes, it's possible. And just for background, um, you know, I think this is a, a very proactive step or, you know, we're trying to take, you know, to look at some of these building or uses and everything like that. Can you just go through what the process is now and what the impact is to a potential client or to um, somebody who wanted to raise, rent a space and why we're trying to streamline this process for that? Uh, as to why we're doing this? Well, like, uh, what's a conditional use permit oh. process? Is that a, a four month process and what the impact is to a tenant or um, or a potential tenant or you know, to a building owner? Sure. So as opposed to a permitted by right use or a permitted use where um, notwithstanding getting a business license and other there's state licensing involved uh, that's not directly related to the city um, purview, uh, they would otherwise be able to move immediately into a, uh, a tenant space or, or building uh, where a CUP requirement exists for a specific type of use or a location or both. Uh, they would need to go through a discretionary application and review process, which would come before the Planning Commission, ultimately. So they would initially submit to staff for a conditional use permit, possibly other permits they're going for, like a design permit, sign permit. And uh, it, generally, depending on the complexity uh, and other entitlements being applied for, it may be a two to six month process. So there, it, it could be in terms of trying to find a tenant space. It could be a process um, that 
that a potential tenants would need to think about. But as far as, say, an existing tenant or, or a property manager owner pursuing a, a CUP or pursuing one with a, a specific tenant in mind, they could do that. And provided these, these permits didn't lapse, it would ostensibly run with the land and subsequent tenants could take advantage of that as well. So but the, the difference here would be that whereas today many properties in our commercial corridor are prohibited from certain type of uses and there is not a process in which they comply for a conditionally allowed use there, this would give uh, many of those sites uh, a, a different uh, route. So I just forget, it's about a two to six months process and then the estimated like uh, financial impact uh, to go through that process? As far as the conditional use permit uh, alone, yeah. we would typically take in a deposit around $3,000 and it's billed against for hard costs and staff time. We, we typically start there. I would say the majority of applications do not exceed that. If it's a more complicated one, usually involving redevelopment, I'll, I'll add, then they might exceed that. But for things like a restaurant uh, use, uh, but not substantial change of a building or, or, some, or an alcohol licensing, those generally stay within that, that deposit. No, I appreciate the feedback. I, I, I appreciate that uh, Commissioner Westman brought this up, you know, I don't know, three months ago or something like that, and add some, you know, highlight to this as a, maybe a potential need, and, you know, we could talk about it, um, and also streamlining process, and also um, I just want to understand the background of a two to six month process, and it's $3,000, it's good to have that, you know, just on a back end of the story. So thank you. For me, I think this is a step in the right direction. Um, when I brought up the item, I, I can't remember exactly when it was. I think it was when the dialysis center went in on Clear Street. Um, the council got quite concerned about the loss of retail space on you know our main retail area and, and revenue. So um, the ordinance was changed then, which created um, the restrictions that we currently have. And I think we're all seeing um, environments changing. I mean, we just have to look at the mall and know that it's different now than it was 10 years ago. So um, coming up with a process that will allow landlords to fill spaces that will work effectively for office and still not be detrimental to, you know, the main commercial uses on 41st Avenue, I think is a good approach. And um, I think this is a good first step in moving in the, that direction. Agreed. Is there, um, I don't know, and I should maybe ask this earlier, is there like a map of, of where these areas are? Or is it just, I was just wondering like how many estimated areas are there like this? And sorry, I should have asked earlier, sorry about that. I can, I can ask Ben if something was prepared on, on his end for this. I don't think so though. Uh, however, uh, based on where our our CR uh, corridor is, it, it is somewhat limited uh, by its very nature. And, and these restrictions apply to specific streets. And because the zoning changes around the uh, Capitola Road intersection, that you can look at our zoning map and kind of see where it, it follows. Yeah, I, I looked at the zoning map, I just meant like particular units, like out of that whole area, is there, is this 10 units? Is it 30 units? And, that, and if it wasn't prepared, I should ask earlier. Yeah, you know, I'll add to that. I think it's it's the majority of, it's the two buildings along 40th Avenue, but it also, the way it's been written now that um, we're not prohibiting a multi-use building that has office space from continuing as office space, it really protects all the buildings that have existing office space. And so we can keep um, that, opportunity for businesses and then really if a new building is built that's where it really limits future office space but really um preserving the rights of anyone who owns office space in capitola so so the map would be lots of dots wherever there's existing office space along 41st avenue north of capitola road and then definitely 40th avenue okay. yeah i think it's a positive step thank you any other questions? No, I think I, I agree with uh, 
Mr. Westman, I think it's a good idea to do this under the kind of rule. Something's better than nothing. We want to attract people into the city because we need you know sales tax revenue, and if they're not coming for retail and they're coming for office. It's better than nothing. Yeah. And also, I think the guidance, if if you're going to reconstruct on anything on 41st on either side of the street, um, at least it gives them some guidance as how they could use the building going forward, which I think is very useful. Yeah. I'm okay with this. I guess my only <laughs> concern would, is kind of what Jerry was alluding to, which is like we're getting to the point where we have a special code for every parcel in the city. But uh, but if that's what we have to do, that's what we have to do. <laughs> yeah. I think attracting um, as much occupancy for those tenant spaces is is really important. So. Okay, um, I want to open the public hearing <laughs> for, but I don't, would that be worthwhile as we're just to sure. keep status quo as we move through this? Okay, so um, we can open the public hearing if anybody would like to speak to this topic. Hearing none, closing the public hearing. <laughs> Do you have anything um, bringing it to the commission deliberation? I think we uh, we did. We deliberated. Okay. Okay. Just trying to follow format. <laughs> okay. Um, so any any additional input that you need, Ben, to move on? No. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So with this, I'm going to hand it. Over to Sean, who's going to handle the second story decks and balconies item. All right. This is a uh, recurring theme, I think, with zoning code updates for the city of Capitola. I think this is the third round of zoning amendments we've made where second story decks have been included. Um, but I, but maybe with these changes, we'll we'll get to a, a middle ground, so to speak. And that's, that's really what we're, we're trying to do with these revisions today. Uh, it's building off of what had already been covered in the previous sessions, where we clarified some of the, the in, uh, intent behind roof deck prohibi prohibitions, but, uh, but clarifying that there's a, a deck credit for up to 150 square feet. Um, the, the added provisions in the code that we are going to cover today um, come about both from the public uh, designers in, in the community and uh, who have submitted since these current standards have been in place um, and tried to work with them as well as and then letting staff know their thoughts including one of which which we included in the packet as an additional attachment um, as well as the staff's experience and input from the Planning Commission so Following the last meeting, hearing that uh, the Planning Commission would like to see a bit of the, the build out because we hadn't updated the diagram in the, in the last uh, discussion on decks. Uh, we did that, but we also considered the, the general sentiment of the Planning Commission and the staff's experience in the public comment, and we added a couple provisions. Um, namely, that uh, there's an increase in the allowed projection, uh, as we, you may have may you recall from previous sessions, the maximum deck projection, which we have interpreted as being from the upper wall, not any wall, not a lower wall, uh, ends up being pretty restrictive in terms of how big a deck can be, even with respect to the 150 square foot deck credit. Um, so that is being proposed to increase to 10 feet, uh, which would allow people to utilize uh, the deck space for a number of activities, but not necessarily uh, standalone activities or or a recreational centerpiece um, and the other change is that uh, two other changes relate to setbacks the interior side setback and the front setback the front setback we considered and I, I think personally this is probably one of the most uh, interesting changes is to allow decks to project five feet forward which is parallel with the a front lower story setback and why this is uh, 
potentially beneficial to designers and projects is because that space would not compete with the uh, um, building envelope of the primary dwelling on the second story. So you're now creating an, an incentive and opportunity for decks in the front, which seems to also be in line with where the Planning Commission would like to see them to mitigate privacy uh, considerations. So this first slide here shows the existing diagram and uh, envelope of where upper story decks can be. Uh, I'll note as the diagram says that this is not necessarily a, a potential build out because there's limitations on, on having a, a side deck. So it needs to predominantly or at least as much face the rear front as the side. But that is generally the area in which decks can be built with the more restrictive side rear setbacks. With the proposed changes, it would look something a little bit more like this. It's a bit more of a complicated diagram, but we're showing a regular lot as well as a corner lot. The hatched areas represent where those, again, decks could be built. Um, and up at the top in this lighter shade hash, that's where the front first story uh, setback would be and where decks can be, but not the upper story envelope could be. So that's beyond the building. Mm -hmm. Just to sort of show this a little more clearly, the areas in red show you the effective difference this would have on the, the buildable area for decks. I don't think I mentioned it yet, but on the interior side, within the front 25 feet of the lot, they would be able to build to the standard side setback rather than the more restrictive 10 foot setback. So we've, we've proposed to keep that more restrictive 10 foot side setback further back, but uh, relax it towards the front. Again, assuming that this is sort of the most middle of the road approach when we're looking at existing developments, both next to a property and on site, as well as a, a new project. This would generally mitigate any potential concerns related to privacy. And I think that's the last slide I have on second story tax. So open it up to the planning commission. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, yeah, I guess it started as a question. Um, so the, um, the horizontal red line that's closest to the building or the bottom horizontal red line, you could, according to your new code, you could, as, as long as the building uh, face was, was 10 feet back, you could lower that to have that six feet go up to 10 feet, right? Are you, sorry, sorry I'm, I'm not understanding it fully. So I'm looking at your little Tetris red thing there and um, so it says 20, so it's got 20 feet on the right one. Okay, so it says 20 feet. So that could be, you could add, 20, make that 24 feet uh, provided the face of the um, uh, second story building was, was back. Okay, and, uh, and all right, so my next issue is, is, a, is an argument, not a question, so. <laughs> uh, so. One thing that I think we're missing in here is I, I don't have any difficulty. I mean, we, we have decks in the front yard because they face the street. Seems like on a corner lot, you ought to be able to have a deck on the side of the house that faces the adjacent street. So um, for me, I think this is a good start, but I would add allowing decks on the side you know, on a corner lot that face the adjacent. Are we doing questions or arguments? I think we could have a discussion. I'm just saying, I, don't, I don't understand the logic of not doing that. Ah. Peter, what would you like to add? If that's a question, I can. What is the logic of so, not doing that? <laughs> so uh, decks could be constructed facing the street side. The, what this shows, though, is that if they did, it would be unlike the front. It would still be competing with the building envelope. So um, just as the convention is today for the front, they would sort of be choosing, do I want to put massing there? Do I want to have a deck there? Whereas on the front, we're proposing something to project beyond that. 
when we prepared these revisions, we did consider a similar uh, allowance along sort of wrapping around on the exterior side. I think the, the main reason we didn't is because we're moving from a, a 20 foot to a 15 foot setback along this, the, the actual frontage and on the street exterior side, it's already a 10 foot setback up and down. Um, so we, you know, thinking about that and thinking where would be a, a clean met cutoff of five feet or something, it, it's pretty close to the to the front or exterior side setback. So that was that was probably the primary reason, but it's something the planning commission could consider. Thank you for that explanation. Any more questions before we move to discussions? <laughs> Have a question. Um, and so, looking at this, um, I guess my question would be: How would it be phased in? Um, if a, would this be like all new permitted projects going forward once it's adopted? And what if there was a project in the middle of this part uh, under construction? They were they bring in a revision. How does that how does that get handled from that standpoint? Let me just uh, ask a, a quick clarifier. Are you asking if a project had already been approved and was under construction, or are you asking if, say, a project was under plan review uh, prior to, say, a public hearing? Uh, active permit. When they just come as, when they then build, like, come in as a, an alteration to their plans to then abide by what the new code has adopted. Yeah, um, there's actually a great example of this in Capitola. So um, on Escalona Drive, there's a home that's been under construction for a couple of years. And you'll recall that at one point there was, um, the, the code actually changed. So they, and they didn't come in during the window of when that could have been a deck over the second story. So um, if someone has an active building permit, they could come in for a modification we would look at it and see if it if it's minor or um, needs planning commission approval. So we would make that determination when they come in to the counter. If we have an active permit for planning application, um, we could we would definitely inform. We have been informing applicants that we are looking at our decks because this comes up so regularly. Um, but they would have the option to modify their plans as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. For that. No? I'm going to take this opportunity to open the public hearing one more time if anybody has anything to say about public or second story decks. No, nope. hearing none, closing the public hearing. <laughs> Would we like to discuss it more before we? Yes. Okay. So the six foot setback is being increased to 10. And uh, I don't know how the heck my. Um, property got approved in 2011 because I've got a deck where I have a, a dining table up there and so does my neighbor. They have a large deck that uh, is, you know, you call it a party deck, but that's kind of derogatory. It's just a nice large deck, a gathering place uh, with a view and sunshine and that. And so I don't know why we can't, we have to restrict it to anything really 10 feet. Why not 20 feet if they want to sacrifice uh, bedroom space or second story, whatever, and, and convert that to deck space, I don't know why that's a problem. So I would recommend we just delete that. Well, I don't know exactly sure how you do it, but I think we should um, increase that so that people could have large decks on their second story. If I ask you to clarify if you're referring to the limitation on, on how much a deck can extend out from a from a building wall, or if you're asking about the setbacks from a side property line. How do you get a, a large a footprint of a deck? Is there a methodology there? Um, can I have a deck that's larger than 10 feet deep? Am I, is there something I'm missing? No, you're, you're spot on. I think on the front of the home, you could have a deck that's greater than 10 feet, because you could push the home back the front facade of the second story, but on the would be, back of the home, the, the way it's um, drafted now, it would be a maximum of 10 feet. And the front would be maximum of 15 because of the uh, added overlap. Well, if the three, you, the three, the 
Yeah. Yes, that's where I'm confused. Okay, so I thought, I thought it was restricted to the five feet plus the additional ten, the five feet overhang plus the additional ten feet. So that would be fifteen feet front deck max. Is that wrong? That's, that's how I read the front. One moment. If you wanted to set it back, you could have uh, a deck that you know is twenty feet. Ten feet to the rear deck. So the the projection limitation, uh, it, it does not differentiate between the which side of the building it is on. Uh, but you could go back into the building. You could have a recessed portion of the deck, that's correct. So that would that was the answer I was going to give, uh, which is that if you wanted to have a deck that had an effective depth greater than 10 feet, then the answer is how the standard reads is that it needs to be within, it can, it can only project with uh, 10 feet past a building wall. It's not the wall. It's pretty much any upper story wall. So if it were recessed, then it's, it, that portion is still compliant. So then really you're looking at what's in front of the home. So you've got to, <laughs> I'm not sure you answered the question or maybe I just can't understand. So if I was to wanted to recess that front wall uh, 40 feet from the, from the, the line, from the uh, property line, so that my, my second story bedroom is 40 feet back, I can have, if you go back to that picture, that one, so my front story is 40 feet back from that property line, I could have uh, all of that all the way uh, to within 15 feet of the property line deck. Your deck would be 26 feet deep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. You're sacrificing floor area. So that's more than 10 feet from the not, front Not face, how, how it's drafted, no. Yep, so the that's not how it's drafted. You can make the whole, in, in the extreme, you can make the entire second story a deck, right? As long as you comply with the, the, the 10, well, it's gone. But. All right, I was Setback dimensions. I don't think you could do the entire one, or then it'd become a roof deck. <laughs> right, I was going. So the, yeah, I, the put draft, a, I put a little. You, have, you, have, you <laughs> have to have a little bedroom up there that acts it on to yeah, your deck. Correct. But effectively, I love that intent. So, I just don't know if that's how it reads. Why don't I read uh, the standard here as as drafted? The sec a second story deck or balcony may not project further. And 10 feet from the exterior building wall to which it is attached. So regardless of which, what the orientation of the deck would be, it would still need to be 10 feet within an upper story wall. So the so we what's shown up above um, isn't intended to show that they can project further than that. And, and the way that we've read the, that standard about projection is projection from a wall, it's not necessarily a balcony. It's, it's once it extends past that front wall or that side wall, that is where you start measuring. I mean, just, um, I think it opens up, um, you know, second floor decks, right? I mean, because if you had a single story home, you could really just put a staircase up, have a closet, and then you have a whole second floor deck on top of the house. No, that's it's addressed on roof deck. So that, that's, I mean? that is already addressed as part of the roof deck ordinance. So you, you can't, I mean, there's a whole roof deck section that kind of disallows that kind of thing. So assuming, like Susan says, if you had a bedroom, as long as you, don't, if you have that bedroom up on the second deck, in my opinion, you should have the rest of that floor area be bal a balcony if you want it. But the code says, no, only 10 feet. Maybe you can help me. What's the difference between a balcony and then a, a second floor deck? What's the difference between this? I mean, with my example that I just threw out, and you said, oh, there's a whole other deck section that you couldn't do that. If we're saying, if what I'm hearing is that we would get rid of the, the issue of having a 10 foot, it could be any depth it wants. It could be a whole second floor. Well, it can't be the whole second floor. So the point is, is that the, it can't be above the top plate of, that's a roof deck, if it's above the top plate of your building. So the top plate 
is by definition, there's got to be a room there. So a bedroom, a bathroom, whatever the heck is on that second story, you have to have a living space on the second story to, ha to call it a second story building. Right. Therefore, as long as you have some living space up there, the rest of it could be balcony the way I it's not would like what it. you just read. Exactly. So that's why I think it needs to be I, changed. I agree with you. That you I, should allow that. I wonder if we want to break up decks are different from balconies. Um, you know, a balcony is something, in my mind, that extends beyond the building. And um, I think that's sort of been uh, the crux of our concern, people doing extensions sort of beyond the building that are going to encroach in the setback and have an impact on the neighborhood. So, you know, I'm wondering if on the front, we want to have a definition for, uh, you know, how far the balcony can go. Um, uh, you know, I mean, on this diagram, the hatch part shows deck balcony setback. So I'm perceiving that you could have, you know, a deck in any of that hash mark area. So, um, but. So, so we need a definition for the balcony part that's going to extend, and a definition for deck area. The picture, the that picture one? there, this <laughs> makes sense, and I think I think that if we can give them direction, that we're all kind of agreeing that this this artificial ten foot setback is not what we're looking for, but that we we would like to have large second story decks, and we can call a balcony something else. But the idea of yeah, that whole hashed area, like you say. Are as allowable area for deck space, provided there is a second story there that you know makes it legal. I think me, that's I'm, what we're going for. Go ahead. I'm talking about a front, the front deck, not decks in the back deck. Okay. <laughs> so the way the picture is is the way you want it, where the dark cross hatched area basically is allowable. You could put a deck there. The way I would look at that picture, the way it's labeled, the legend says deck slash balcony setback, the dark hatch mark, not the lighter gray overhang that Mr. Weston was talking about, but the dark stuff, it allows what we just talked about. But what you read won't allow that. It doesn't, it's, they don't jive in my the way so, I understand. So it. that's the space where a deck could be, but wherever that second story structure is, it's going to be limited to 10, 10 feet, feet from the wall. That wall. Oh. Yeah, okay. That's our problem, I think. It, I think yeah. you just need to delete that 10-foot requirement. Yeah, I think so, too. <laughs> yeah, and then it would, it would just, um, if you deleted the 10-foot requirement, but you said that the deck had to be within these setback areas and above the first story is what I'm hearing. Oh. But I think it becomes a problem if the deck is, like, in the rear yard. So I think we want to tie this to front yard decks because we've all sort of said if somebody has a deck in the front yard, then it really doesn't have the same impact on the neighbors around them as if it is in the rear. I personally don't care if it's the front or the rear, but I understand your argument. We, were, we took the approach of being more lenient in the front yard. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I apologize. I thought the 10-foot requirement was only in the rear, so I didn't realize that that's also applicable to the front. One, we could do it. One modification could be that there's not the 10-foot limitation on the front, so a person could bump their interior of their home back and have a really large front deck. Mm -hmm. um, that's one option, or the other would be to remove. Another option would be to increase from the six feet. We were proposing 10. You could maybe propose 12, 15 feet, or remove it altogether. So, um. For me, if we could keep the 10 in the back, come up with, um, you know, a, a reasonable number, I think, would be like 20 feet in the front. 
I feel like if the if there's if the FAR and you know is available, I, I disagree. I, I agree with Peter's comments about the front and the back. I, I don't have. I mean, I have an opinion, but I, I understand the argument, and I think I'm trying to respect the argument because I understand the zero lot lines are are aggressive with the rear decks. So, but if the FAR is available for the front for the front um, decks and they have enough, you know, gumption to want to have that size of a deck on their front on the front side of their house. I feel like it adds to the streetscape. I don't think there there should be a limitation. I mean, okay. if I if we want to compromise, go along with that as okay. long as there's one in the rear. Okay, okay, let's get. <laughs> I'm okay with that too. Okay. Yeah, I, I would go with that. I think that's right. Ten feet on the back, and then, like you said, get rid of the ten feet on the front. Perfect. So. No limit on the front and 10 feet on the back. So, and they're not connected. I do think we have to have something that so it doesn't become a roof deck. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I think there has to be something that, um, you know, 50% of the second story can be a deck, 60%, I don't, you know. Uh, but something so that there well, is a second story element to the building. There, That's where I was getting to. Is, you know, if somebody put a room 10 by 10. Yeah. And so then I said the whole ref is going to be a deck. You know, now they have a roof deck under. Well, it's limited by their FAR calculations. Right. So I mean, that kind of, it's a moot point. No, but you could game the system that way. You say, okay. Way? So the definition of a roof deck now, it says, okay, uh, it's above the top plate. And uh, you know it doesn't doesn't uh, accommodate you know the entrance ways, but you could game the system and say, okay, I'm putting a ten by ten bedroom there, and with a stairway next to it, and well, storage for but, my patio furniture. But <laughs> but well, but really, but it's, well, why is that a problem? Because you have a height limitation, so you can't go but twenty five feet. So if you want to, I'm just saying, it, it, just going back in the history, you know, looking at the conversation all about roof decks it just i think i've always heard it at you know second floor roof decks would this be a single story roof deck right that would be my only thing just bringing up the conversation that we should be just make sure we understand there ought to be some percentage and it doesn't have to be huge like 30 percent of the second story needs to be building i'd, so. be, I'd be okay with 50. okay 50 percent Sounds like 40, 30, 40. We'll go with 50. So if, if so, let me, I, with 50, I'm happy. I want to clarify really fast. Because <laughs> if, okay, so if you're saying that 50% of the upper story has to be a building to, to, to then authorize a, a deck, is that what, is that what I'm hearing? 50% of the. If you said the second story has to be living space, living space. and not a deck, if that's what she's saying. And so that's not just a bedroom. Both, they both count into the Well, you bar, can do a big for, bedroom up there if you want. Right. That would, but you would need to provide 50% of that, of that area to be a, a, a giant bedroom to then authorize more. 50% of the building to be deck. Otherwise, you get into roof deck territory. Yes, I understand. But it, I'm just saying that, like, there's a... The, my. <laughs> Where where I'm coming from is I look at the, the the flood the flood zones where the lower story is parking pretty much and then you're just limiting a lot of the the second story to be not outdoor space and so I'm just thinking of quality of life wise you know where where is that design going it's just going to be enclosed space and we're just pushing people to have enclosed space so what about you know they living don't, roof they don't, they don't have to have enclosed space if they want to have that second story space up there they can. They can decide what they want to do with that second story space. They just have to have 50% of it be something. Something. <laughs> okay. I, yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't agree, but it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Well, I'm anxious to hear your argument. So you're saying that, uh, let's, let's say the, the bottom story is parking, mm -hmm. so that all the living space is on the second story, and you're saying, well... I want to have a lot of that living space outdoors. Mm -hmm. So I just have my bedroom, my little bedroom and my little micro kitchen and the rest of it's balcony. And that happens to take up 70% of the second story. And you're okay with that. 
I mean, generally speaking, yeah, our the living roof, um, you know. I mean, the, the size of the parcels that we have. Yes, I, mean, I, have I to acknowledge. Be realistic. I mean, yes. you're not going to have anything, and this would be on a bigger parcel, a, a thousand square feet up there. Mm -hmm. And if that's going to be their living area, um, you know, saying that 500 square feet of it can be deck and 500 square feet needs to be yeah. living area seems reasonable to me. Right. That that I I it does it does seem reasonable within those numbers. I just I think I'm just hesitant to put such a stringent limitation on um, that ratio. I just feel like in it in terms of designing something, you could approach it with okay. I what if I want a small little bedroom up there? The majority of my FAR down below, and then. Um, I mean, it just it just creates more restriction. And that's all I think. It, it, well, I tend to agree with you, um, but I also understand the argument about, about gaming the system and turning a, a you know a roof deck into a second story deck. And so yeah. we, the rationale would be to just try to come up with a number okay. so you can't game that system. And okay. fifty percent, sixty percent, some other wording. I don't care what the wording is, but I think it's a legitimate argument to try to try to eliminate, quote, roof decks because you're going to define them as second-story decks. Understood. Thank you. There might be, not to throw a twist into it, but maybe in the village, in the floodplain, might be a different conversation than if you're up in a different neighborhood where you have, you don't have those conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, living space can be on the first floor. Yeah. I'm willing to accept it. I just I just wanted to present the devil's advocate side. Oh, no, I, I appreciate, I appreciate that as well. <laughs> Anyway. Well, and people could ask for a variance. Yes, yes, that's. But those you have to support the findings for that, and that just provides more and more the layers of restriction for a proper design for these tiny lots. It just it doesn't. I don't know if it's just warranted. Is my is I just you want to build something that's appropriate for that lot that makes that takes advantage of the sun, and takes in consideration the context of the neighborhood. That's that's all. So. I I'm willing. Fifty percent. <laughs> All right. I'm willing to to, to go. Okay. Um, does that provide good feedback? Is it clear, kind of? I think so. We maybe we'll take a tally of all the direction at the end. Okay. Okay. Um, do we have any other items? We, we actually have a few more slides uh, based on some questions we received before the meeting. All right, so I am back, and um, just a few things. Uh, there were some other changes to the zoning code amendments since the Planning Commission last saw it. Um, there were a few things in the accessory dwelling units chapter, uh, the demolition and replacement of dwelling unit chapter, and the development and design review committee chapter. We just wanted to flag that um, to make sure you were aware that there there were some changes in the highlighted yellow text to those sections. Uh, in the last couple of days, we've been looking at the demolition and replacement of dwelling unit section, and we think we need to change that further. Um, most most uh, notably to add some language um, related to the no net loss of housing element sites under state law. Um, there is some program language in the housing element that says that the city needs to establish a procedure um, to make sure that we comply with that law. Um, and so we're going to add some language to the zoning code that sort of calls that out, make sure it's not overlooked, um, and sort of identifies what's the procedure for um, complying with the no net loss law um, with the housing element site. So we're going to need to add that. We're working with the city attorney to make sure that we get the language just right. Um, and that's something that will um, uh, be uh, added to the amendments uh, when they come back to you in two weeks. Okay. And uh, so we received a few uh, questions and comments from planning commissioners in advance on these three topics. And uh, we want to speak to that uh, and answer those questions. Next slide, please. So the first question was about large 
residential care facilities and why do they need to be part of a mixed use project. So on the slide, you see the allowed use table, um, which uh, identifies large residential care facilities as um, being allowed in the commercial zones um, with a conditional use permit, but only as part of a mixed use project. So um, it could not be a standalone um, single use uh, residential care facility. Next slide, please. And so the reason for that is um, uh, the housing element in state law requires the city to permit large, resident, large residential care facilities um, in the same manner um, as other residential uses, um, such as multifamily dwellings. And so uh, in the commercial zones, um, multifamily dwellings are only allowed um, as part of a mixed use project. Uh, and so we're essentially applying that same rule um, to uh, large um, residential care facilities. So that's the that's the reason for that. Okay. So in essence, I got it backwards. What you're saying, is make, um, maybe I don't understand. The large care, the care facility is considered a commercial thing and it has to be mixed with a residential attachment. Is that what you're saying? No, um, because um, in our regional commercial zone mm -hmm. that you can have standalone commercial or you can have mixed use but residential is not standalone unless there's a commercial use on the property so therefore it's it's considered a residential use but it has to be in a mixed use project just to make sure that it we're not allowing just standalone residential so that's uh, that yep. was my question so you're saying <laughs> It's kind of weird to me. A large residential care facility, in my mind, is a commercial entity. It's not a residential entity. It's it's run by a for-profit or non-profit company. Am I getting that wrong? But it's it's housing um, individuals, yeah, well, okay. so it's yeah. Yeah, it's it's considered under state law a residential use. Yeah. Really? Yes. Okay. I, okay. All right. Fine. Move on. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, any other uh, commission questions or comments on this topic? All right. So next slide, please. So there's a question on plan development zones. What is the purpose of the plan development zone? Is this part of the code obsolete? Um, is the PD zoning truly enhancing development? Uh, and what would be the impact if these were rezoned? Next slide, please. So here is the city's zoning map, and the PD zone is shown in the dark blue, and it applies to a number of properties, um, primarily uh, condominiums and other multifamily development. Um, and what PD zoning is, is um, sort of a um, unique zoning district that's applied to a particular property with, it, with its own customized development standards. And it's a tool that allows for um, providing for flexibility in um, development uh, in order to address sort of unique site conditions or a creative vision for the development of um, the project. Next slide, please. Oh, no, go back, please. Uh, yeah, so um, that's the reason for why the plan development exists. I think that um, we recommend keeping the PD zone as just sort of a tool that's available to an applicant um, if they want to do something that departs from um, uh, development standards that apply in other zones. And um, in terms of rezoning um, in the existing PD zones, um, they have their own sort of custom um, development standards, uh, and um, we recommend keeping that and not rezoning those PD properties to something else. Right, but but if I were to, if I were a developer and I want to come in and, and demolish the cap the Knoll Oak on the top one by the freeway, right? The, the, it doesn't tell you. It refers to something in the general plan about how we're more lenient or we have different. Uh, zoning requirements for a PD area, but the general plan doesn't say anything about that. There's nothing in there at all. I checked it multiple times. And, the, and there's nothing in the zoning that says, what do we, as a developer, what, um, 
liberty do I have to change anything in this in this area? It doesn't it just says we you have to give us a development plan and we'll maybe approve it if we think it's okay. But there's no guidance given to any developer. So I was kind of struggling. I, did we do this in the 70s to enhance somebody to come in and build these properties, which I think that's probably what it was. Mm -hmm. Now they're built. What What's the impacts of leaving it at that? And does it stop a developer from, the, like those Capitola Knoll thing at the top right there, that is really low density stuff. Mm -hmm. And I don't see how a developer would be enticed to come in and make it higher density with what we've written. Because it doesn't say that you can go higher density. It doesn't say it doesn't. Re it doesn't give it many guidance. I guess that's what I was mostly worried about. If I rezoned it and said you could be forty du per acre. Then hey, somebody might come in and do that. So I think one of the difficulties, and we talked about this when we talked about you know the rezoning of of some of the districts, is <laughs> that if if a project on the site is not consistent with the zoning on that site, then um, I've seen projects where they've gone into disrepair because getting any kind of financing to maintain that project becomes extremely difficult. And the dark blue areas that we have on our map are projects that are already developed. Mm -hmm. And um, certainly someone could come in if you know they were going to tear down the capital and Knowles and want to redo that, uh, I think the process that they would go through is they would come in and they would probably ask to rezone the property to conform to what their new project is going to be. But for us to rezone it uh, with the existing project that's there, which you know realistically is going to stay there. <clears throat> or of the foreseeable future, um, we we do a disservice to the project by making it more difficult for them to get money to maintain their buildings and um, you know keep that property functioning. And I I don't. Yeah, well, I mean, if you if you want to, you know, uh, you know. Even even if you allow 40 units per acre on that site, then you know you're you're talking about having to deal with all the laws about the existing people who live there. Those are condominiums that are in separate ownership, so everybody's going to have to agree to it. I mean, it seems like you're right. creating but a in th just sort of in theory. If we if we did the 40, then the current owner could actually just add units without doing anything to the existing units because there's a lot of empty land there that that's what I that's what I'm tr kind of struggling with yeah. we've got empty think, land we need housing and we're not enticing anybody to use that empty so land. so I have if a question for oh, I'm sorry can, can I ask a question for a bit there used to be a lot in state law about spot zoning and you know my recollection is they passed laws which allowed for planned development which really allowed communities to do what in essence was spot zoning because you could give a different zoning to that parcel than any other parcel that you had in town. And I don't know if the state laws as far as spot zoning have changed significantly in the last few years or if it's still the same. Yeah, so with spot zoning, you need to be concerned if you are reducing the, the, the development potential of a parcel and you are not um, similarly reducing um, surrounding parcels. So I, I think, I think that, um, and state law prohibits the city essentially from doing that right. under the Housing Crisis Act now anyway. So that's not really something that we need to be um, uh, concerned about with the PDs. So, um, you know, as, as you know, um, we have decided to um, discuss increased density in the RM zones um, further in 2025 and to not um, tackle that at this time. You know, it's possible that the city could consider um, making changes to the PD sites to, um, under existing zoning, allow for increased density. Um, uh, and there's a number of different ways that the city could do that, um, either um, entirely rezoning it to a new RM zoning district, for example, 
or making an amendment to the approved PD zoning for each individual property to specifically say that additional units are allowed. Um, and so if that's something that the Planning Commission is interested in maybe doing, that would be appropriate to consider as part of the larger RM rezoning discussion that will happen in 2025. Yeah, that, that last avenue was kind of what I was thinking about when I wrote this up originally. Like, well, I don't know where that development plan is. Somebody somewhere has got it in some filing cabinet, I guess, because it's probably on a typewritten piece of paper. Um, <laughs> so you can't research as what what is the, what are the requirements for at least the one I'm talking about. I don't know about the, uh, the one with the mobile home. Yeah, they're kind of frozen in time. For From the time they're approved, there's not much unless it was built into that PD of how they could evolve. It, it So I, I think it would be interesting to revisit in 2025 when we look at the multifamily. Yeah. If yeah, that, I think that's a good idea. I agree. All right. Okay. And so the last question had to do with um, historic character and the design permit criteria. So in our design permit chapter, there is design review criteria related to historic character. Uh, and we received a comment that um, this design criteria is still subjective. Uh, should we include more descriptive language that addresses character, separation of historic and non-historic designs, and relative massing to name a few, uh, and uh, concern that this process is non-transparent to potential applicants. Next slide, please. And um, so, uh, as you recall, with our design permit criteria, uh, we made um, a few targeted amendments that adds references to design um, uh, standards in the zoning code that are more objective. Um, and uh, we see this as sort of a first step to move more towards, uh, towards more objective standards and reduce reliance on subjective requirements. Um, and with that in mind, um, I think that uh, we've proposed uh, some, we've prepared some uh, further revisions to the historic character language um, that maybe elaborates a little bit more um, as to what this design criteria means. Um, and so you can see here on this slide that there is some underlying red text, which is our um, proposed change to the design review criteria. So under this, um, with the first sentence, uh, we um, add a reference to the Secretary of, Secretary of Interior Standards, um, which is contained in, uh, or which is a part of Chapter 1784 and the criteria used to approve um, uh, historic uh, alteration permits. And then with the second sentence, um, you know, as it's written now, it says new structures, additions, or modifications to non-historic structures complement the character and development pattern of nearby historic resource, resources and districts. Uh, it's very ambiguous as to what, um, you know, what we mean by that and what, what, what does it mean to complement um, uh, surrounding uh, development. And so we've added to that um, a little bit more information about in terms of massing, scale, building placement, and facade treatments. So uh, in response to sort of the question and comments on um, the design permit criteria for historic character, these are our sort of proposed revisions for your consideration. Yeah. Okay. So I brought this one up as well. I, I like I like what you've done there, Ben. I think the just amplifying a little bit about what the Secretary, uh, Secretary of the Interior's requirements are makes sense. So people know you've got to go back and look at that because I think they're, the way they've described preservation of historical structures is actually pretty good. It's fairly clear what you've got to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, it's a, I think putting emphasis on this is a really great idea or a, a solid move. So is there going to be a reference? Um, the document, uh, as opposed to just the Secretary of Interior Standards, or the references in another section, I forget which one it is, but it, it's clearly stated what, what the reference is to the Secretary of the Interior st stuff. So it's, you know where to go to look it up. 
Yeah, okay, that's good. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, and that was all Katie on crafting this language. <laughs> <laughs> ben, I had a, a, just one more thing to add with uh, some code updates. Uh, another yeah. question that had come up were, uh, was that if we could look at some of the references in our glossary, we did look at that, and some of the um, references from the glossary into the residential chapter need to be updated, and one of them, one of the other glossary definitions needs to be renumbered to reflect an added item. So they're not in here, but they are just uh, harmonizing uh, corrections. And that's all I had. That was me. I, I found some typos. <laughs> I didn't have good questions like you. Yeah, I think we'll do we'll do a final kind of um, close read um, of everything, and then make sure that all of our cross references are correct and updated as needed. Okay, so this table has been getting shorter and shorter um, over um, the past couple of meetings, and these are our next steps. So September 19th, this is shown correctly here, is the hearing date um, for the Planning Commission, where you will be asked to make a recommendation to the City Council on these amendments. And then the City Council is scheduled to consider the Planning Commission recommendation and have its public hearing on the amendments on October 10th, with um, a second reading um, plan for October 24th. Thank you, Ben. All right, that can yeah, And that's my very last slide. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, all right, so that, that concludes the all of the points in which we addressed tonight. It's a presentation, right? But we still need to comment. Oh, do we? Since we went through everything point for point. Sure. If you have any additional items to discuss regarding the zoning code update, um, now would be the time. And we may want to reopen the, ask the public and make sure they don't have any more comments. If we open the public hearing, or the Opening the public hearing right now, if we, anybody would like to say anything on any of the address points. Yeah, go ahead. And Yep, please, yes. And please sign your name and speak directly into the microphone. I'm Linda Barnes, and um, I'm not sure if I really understood the deck issue completely. But my feeling is that if however much land each building is on, whether there's deck space on it or not, there should be enough space for trees to be planted in that space. And if the deck is so much up in the air that an umbrella from the tree can't grow there, then we need to decrease the deck size because we need to make sure we're planting trees in this area. We're, we're cutting down trees at an incredible rate. And that's part of the reason I came here, it's beautiful. We have big redwoods, eucalyptus, oaks, and they're just being sawed down and replaced with little crepe myrtles. And even next door to me, there were two huge trees and according to the rules, she's supposed to put in four trees. Well, the size of the house she was allotted, she could put in on her property only gives her eight feet of space. She can only put in one dwarf tree really. So where is she supposed to put in other trees? And with the rezoning, where are people going to put in the trees? with the um, 30 units over there near the Calvary Church off Capitola, where are they supposed to put in trees? We really need to think about habitat, our groundwater when it rains, trees absorb water. You know, we re really need to think about the trees in our area and maintain those trees. And if it's deck space that's up in the air, hogging tree space, or it's concrete and nobody wants to rake the needles, we need to really think a little bit better about our trees. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else like to speak on any points this evening? No? Okay. Um, okay, closing the public hearing. And would we like to discuss anything further? I would just like 
since it was on the table, I would like to once again um, just voice my object objection to 17120, which is the design review, which requires a city approved architect. Um, I believe that that's unnecessary delay, unnecessary cost, and the only thing it is adding is an independent subjective review of a building when we're trying to maintain objectivity. The architect is not going to rule on the code. We have plenty of public works and community development directors to do that. So all they're doing is giving maybe some free advice on some structural items, which I don't think we need to pay for, uh, but, but giving subjective opinions, and I just think that's wrong. We've had a lot of architects come and, and speak on this. One of them mentioned that he won't even do business here because of the endless red tape, and we're adding additional layer of red tape. It's going to cause delays. It's going to cause problems. It's going to, I, I, I just can't uh, uh, vote for a code that has that wording in it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody like to speak to that? No. When um, that gets brought back, would there be um, in the final thing uh, what uh, maybe the staff could prepare something to address that from what is the potential cost impact um, that you're looking at and then uh, potential um, delay? Um, I think the last time we reviewed it, it was reviewed as it would be handled during the normal process um, from a timing standpoint that review is done by staff. And then uh, I think there's been some uh, more research done on what that cost impact is. If another design professional was involved, what that would be to an applicant. It would be great to have that brought back at the same time. I think that, do that. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion items? No? Okay. Has staff gotten everything they needed from the review? Okay. Did you want to reiterate any findings? I'm just, I'm just, Sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I think it was pretty clear. Pretty clear. Okay. All right. Great. So um, moving on to item seven is the director's report. Yes. Uh, there's there's a lot going on in our little city. So um, first, uh, Peter, I do want to thank you for bringing up the tree ordinance. And we can, if you'd like, put something on our agenda just to get initial feedback from you from your experience with the tree ordinance i don't think we'll have in-depth analysis because we have so much work going into the zoning code right now but i would like to offer that opportunity to gather your concerns before we i, I think the tree ordinance update will definitely have to wait till 2025 but i would like to get your comments ahead of 2025 just so we have a good idea of what we'll we'll be discussing in the future. If you'd like that, I'd like to offer that um, at a meeting before the end of the year. Um, and we, so thank you. And then I just wanted to bring you up to date on some of the projects. So you've probably noticed that there's the pathway going out of City Hall, and that's going to be a safe pathway for folks to get up to the Monterey Park intersection. So that's really exciting, and I feel safer, or I feel, I feel better about this when um, I leave work every day and know that pedestrians will be safe in the future, especially during those busy summer months. We expect that to be completed in the next, like within the next month. Um, it will be a, a concrete pathway with a concrete wall um, as approved a couple of years back. So, um, and then the community center is um, scheduled to close the Jade Street Community Center on September 20th. Um, currently, we are moving from the community center into the small Opal Cliff School, and the um, the school district has been very um, generous in allowing us to use that space at zero cost. So that, that's great as we're improving the Jade Street Community Center. Um, the also on Park Avenue, there is a mural that's being built. It's a um, in cooperation with the um, the New Brighton Middle School. So you've been probably seeing that come around. And I think they've got more time working on the tiles there, but that should also be completed probably within the next month or so. Um, 
I'll reiterate Commissioner Jensen's comment on this Saturday. Um, there's going to be a volunteer effort for the wharf starting at 7.30 a.m. And there'll be a um, something on the City of Capitola website that people can sign up for that volunteer effort. But again, 7.30 a.m. at the head of the wharf. Um, I want to once again thank Austin for his work here at the City of Capitola. And thank you very much, Austin. And um, I also want to thank you all as uh, you've put in a lot of time and effort towards the housing element certification and a lot of extra evenings and just um, really a very thoughtful conversations that have occurred on, at this table. And I just um, really appreciate all the, the time spent on that effort and um, two plus years to get it through. So um, appreciate all your hard work and dedication. And here we are again with the zoning code updates. So that effort continues. And I just I think you're an amazing group and really have a passion for this and it shows and I really appreciate your dedication. So thank you. And with that, that concludes my director's report. Thank you. Okay, so with that, we're adjourned. I have a, oh, oop, I'm sorry. I'm, sorry. No. I'm just going back to Commissioner Wilkes. He seems like he has some concerns about the tree ordinance and just that, you know, that's pushed off. I mean, is that something that we can have a discussion about to understand, you know, I mean, is there support to see you have some conversation about this before? I mean, I, I've heard this for the last two years at least I've been here. Yeah, I don't. I don't have any problem having a conversation about it. Uh, I do think it's extremely important that we get through the required uh, zoning updates that we need to make for our housing element. And you know, for me, that needs to be the the top priority right now of working our way through that. So you know, once we get through that, and that goes to the city council in um, you know a meeting after that would be great to discuss it or perhaps just a slightly longer meeting <laughs> yeah, I just, just you know it, um, I just heard the time frame at the end of the year I just think with this commission that might be changing I think to have a documented conversation that would go forward to the next planning commission and everybody has comments on um, there's a lot of history of comments that I think aren't maybe aren't recorded completely and maybe just a document to go forward to the next commission would be great. So um, just I'd love to get your feedback on this. So our next planning commission meeting is focused on the housing element implementation. Currently I've heard of one item that you'd like to have come back and that's just the, um, the review of the design review and just the cost estimates or, or two. There's a couple items actually. The items from this evening will um, bring forward the amendments, so those we'll revisit. And then also uh, the design review and city architect, including the timing and cost. Um, I don't expect that meeting to be that long since we have had probably seven meetings on the zoning code updates, and I haven't heard for many more items to be brought back up. So. The following meeting in October, I believe we have three to four planning applications that will be on that meeting. So we could either leave it open as just a, just we won't have much to offer in terms of going through the exact tree ordinance, but just to get your feedback at the next meeting, if you'd like, at the special meeting, or we could um, have an opportunity at the October meeting, but there are three to four other applications. So, it does it. Is there a reference? That's right. Okay. I mean, uh, what's the November? Commissioner Hill is the one who has. Currently, we we I'll squeeze them in while I can. <laughs> um, our calendar right now for November is open, um, but I'm not sure what pen, like there's quite, I know there's quite a few active applications. I'm just not sure if they're complete yet to get in front of planning commission. I'm, I'd be fine. I mean, I think it'd be great to have Commissioner uh, Westman here for that conversation. So, I mean, if it got pushed, if we're tight in October, if it got pushed in November, I think I would just like to have it documented and discussed before the end of the year. Okay. Well, let's plan that then. Okay. I had a couple more.
more questions? If that's okay. Yeah, no, go ahead. There are uh, two things. For those of us that live on the east side, so to speak, uh, we're getting a lot of comments and questions about the Bay Hill, um, whatever you want to call it, to traffic paving effort. Is there going to be any review of that? I know the city's received letters and stuff like that. What, what's the plan there so I can tell people what's going on? So I know that if anyone has comments, we're definitely accepting comments and that it's on our web page of how to submit comments. Um, there will be a review. I'm not sure of the date in which the Public Works Director will be bringing that back to City Council, um, but I can send out an email tomorrow to that effect and let you know. Okay, yeah, that'd be helpful. And then the second one, real quick, the two weeks ago in the... Um, City manager's report, there's a NOAA climate grant that was the uh, Marine Sanctuary got a $71 million for climate uh, climate change and modifications. And item three excluded Silica Creek for some reason, but it included San Lorenzo and then Pajaro and all that. Are, are you the one that's the stucky, so to speak, to deal with the Marine Sanctuary and try to modify what they're going to do? So... Um Erica Sinek in our public works department oversees the grants for the environmental grant. So I can, okay. if you want to send me an email on that, I can yeah. make sure we look into it. Yeah, I, it, I, it was, strikes me as odd that they did everything except Soquel Creek. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they would have done that, which obviously impacts, the, you know, the village, right? And if it floods, the village floods, and they didn't address it. So, okay, I'll send you an email. Thank you. Anything else? No? No? We're good? Okay. All right. So we're adjourned. Um, we're adjourned to the next scheduled special meeting of the Planning Commission on September 19th at 5 p.m. Thank you.